So, welcome to this uh, sixth lecture. So, uh, unfortunately, um, this is going to be an online lecture. So, I hope everyone is is safe um, in uh, the hurricane or you know, is uh, evacuated to a safe place. Um, I myself had to evacuate as well because I'm in uh, zone A here. But uh, fortunately for us here, of course, it didn't turn out to be nearly as bad. Now, rather than having lectures on Saturdays or w whenever to uh, to make up for this um, in person, um, I've decided that we're just going to have uh, one or two make up lectures over um, o over online uh, platforms. So uh, this will be pretty much the same as the lectures that we've uh, we've had in person. Um, so I'm going to go over the same worksheets. They're going to be a little bit shorter because of course there's no need for uh, um, for time to uh, to answer questions. Um, do feel free to send me questions over email um, so that I can answer them that way. Okay, so this is uh, the lecture notebook that you should have and so we'll go through that just like we do usually. Um, we'll load our, our preamble um, materials here, so our, our packages that we use. Um, and last time we talked about tuples, dictionaries, um, and and uh, and of course lists uh, that was two lectures ago um, we talked about functions multiple return values that can be called um, uh, and that can be returned and uh, interpreted as a tuple we talked about default arguments positional versus keyword arguments formal versus informal arguments so all of that should be familiar so what we're going to do today is is use these language constructs in algorithms so um, an algorithm you might be familiar with from um, from from your math courses, uh, for example, if you want to uh, determine all the prime numbers up to a certain integer, then uh, you would use a, um, a, a sieve algorithm to um, filter out all of the um, integer numbers that are multiples of, of one of the long uh, one of the smaller integer numbers. So an algorithm is basically a step by step procedure for solving a particular problem. Um, it's named after the ninth century mathematician. Um, Al-Khwarizmi, um, so Al-Khwarizmi al algorithm. Um, so this this of course points to the um, to the history of uh, mathematics, which is uh, which was very much um, in in the um, in the area that's now the Middle East. Um, it's uh, an algorithm is independent of programming language. Obviously, in the ninth century, there were no programming languages. It's basically a mathematical um, construct. It's a step by step. Um, approach to solving a problem. So it doesn't even have to be on a computer. It's just um, a way to get to the solution that is uh, that is always going to get you to that solution step by step. So the building blocks in these algorithms are going to be our variables or, or logical expressions, the booleans that we've talked about, conditionals that, um, that depend on those booleans, and then loops, while and for loops, um, regular arithmetic, and functions. Um, Functions could be sub-algorithms that do something, um, or, or of course they could be functions in the mathematical sense. And then of course everything will operate typically on um, a set of data. So there's a couple of uh, issues that we have to consider when we look at algorithms. So the important thing is, um, you know, first of all, does our algorithm do the right thing? Does it solve the problem that we want to solve? Is it, is it in other words, a correct algorithm? Um, there may be different algorithms or multiple algorithms that all solve the same problem. Um, so then we are going to compare those algorithms based on how much work they require. Um, in other words, you know, what's the, the resource usage, how much computing time, how much memory, how much disk space. Um, or, of course, if you're thinking about this in terms of uh, non-computer based algorithms, how many people are involved, how many um, team members do I need to include in a, in a specific algorithm to solve a problem. Uh, simplicity will often be a good thing in um, an algorithm. A simpler algorithm will be easier to maintain, easier to understand, um, easier to work with. Um, and then optimality is basically which algorithm is the best one for a particular job, given some definition of best. For example, best could be, uh, let's take as an example, an, a compression algorithm, something that compresses a set of data in a smaller um, smaller memory footprint so the question there could be um, the which algorithm 
does the best job and which which algorithm returns the smallest compressed size um, but that could be at the cost of taking longer to either compress it or even taking longer to decompress it so uh, in in uh, current video compression algorithms it's sometimes not optimal to go to the smallest compression if that takes longer to decompress when you're actually streaming the video for example for hd video um, you might want something that actually is faster to decompress so that you can easily play it back even if it's slower to compress the data so let's look at a um, a couple of simple algorithms and we'll look at more of those when uh, when we get um, to to the in-person lecture on Monday again so let's um, let's do a little exercise here so there's a list of numbers there um, and they're in in some random order they're not sorted and so the question is can you write an algorithm that sorts this list of numbers so if you were to think of this in terms of uh, um, a, a practical situation so let's say you have a set of uh, um, of students with their heights in class and you want to rank them from uh, from uh, tallest to uh, to shortest or something like that um, so this would be the equivalent so how would you approach that um, for a a problem in real life and then does that help you in uh, solving this, this problem um, in uh, in a computer so um, I'll let you think about that so pause the video now um, and think about that for a couple of minutes see whether there's any approach that you can think of that would work here um, see if you can make this work in a couple of cells and then um, try to uh, try to evaluate whether uh, whether it does the right thing in, in these um, four different criteria here so is it is it correct does it actually solve um, assort the, the list of numbers um, how much work does it require is it simple um, and might there be a better algorithm so maybe you can even think of multiple algorithms um, and then uh, um, evaluate them versus each other so take a minute or so to think about that and then come back okay okay so by now um, you've probably thought about some sorting algorithms so um, one that you might have thought about is uh, let's uh, let's loop with a for loop over all elements in this list and let's pick the largest one and then we know that that's the largest one so let's um, move that one to the front of the list and let's move the first element in this list in place of where that tallest or that uh, largest number was and then we repeat with the next um, part of that list excluding that first one which we know was the um, was the largest element okay so that might be one one algorithm um, that you could consider to uh, to sort this list of course there's many mo more algorithms that are possible um, and uh, in this case this is where we're going to uh, talk about this in a little bit more detail um, on Monday so this algorithm where we loop through the list and find the largest value that's actually a fairly inefficient algorithm because what we have to do is loop over all of the elements in this list multiple times so it turns out that there's many algorithms that are much more efficient um, and one thing we're going to talk about a little bit is um, a, a definition of this optimality that is given in terms of the number of elements in this list let's say you have um, in this case I think 10 elements yeah and then little n is going to be 10 um, and the uh, algorithm that you might have come up with might have some um, complexity uh, that is on the order of n squared or n factorial depending on um, the particulars of, of your algorithm so it turns out that there's better algorithms for sorting this list than just looking for the largest element moving that to the front and then looking at the sub list um, that you obtain without that first largest element and then finding the largest element in there and moving that to the front so we'll talk about three different algorithms in the next class um, and uh, we'll talk about you know what what their mutual um, advantages uh, are and which one you might want to use so this is a general example of how you might want to compare different um, algorithms right uh, so based on how how complex are they how um, how much execution time is there and in particular how does that depend on the number of elements um, in my entry data set okay the other thing that this uh, this simple algorithm where we find the largest element 
and we put it in the front and then continue sorting the um, the remaining elements what that points to is this uh, concept of recursion so um, we've talked about recursion in uh, the homework assignment because you were asked specifically um, to solve the problem with a factorial um, using a recursive function so what is a recursive function um, it's a function that basically calls itself so um, think about this in terms of for example the Fibonacci sequence um, if I have my first and second Fibonacci number I can write I can determine my third Fibonacci number um, or in other words I can write my nth Fibonacci number in terms of n minus 1 and n minus 2 so I don't need to know necessarily how I got to n minus 1 and n minus 2 but if I have those I can determine Fibonacci number n same thing with uh, factorials so if I think about factorials I don't need to know how I got to um, n minus 1 factorial I just know that if I take n minus 1 factorial and I multiply with n then I get n factorial so we could write a recursive factorial function um, that is actually fairly elegant um, we can also write a non-recursive factorial function of course we can write this as uh, um, uh, a function that just loops over all of the entries from 1 through n plus 1 um, we just multiply uh, or we keep multiplying with i and then we return that product right that will give us um, the, the factorial um, of the number n so that's the non-recursive um, approach so for 0 I get 1 for 1 I get 1 for 2 I get 2 6 24 120 so those are the factorial numbers of course so for a recursive function we would do this differently um, we would uh, write a function that um, says basically that my factorial of n is my factorial of n minus 1 times n so very um, very simply my factorial recursive n and I'll go over this in class in more detail so we'll put our doc string here um, compute n factorial using recursion and so we'll return my factorial recursive of n minus 1 times n now of course we still have a problem here um, we haven't specified what we want to do with uh, n equals 0 right if we just do my factorial of n minus 1 times n and then we'll just continue um, calling my factorial with n minus 1 n minus 1 n minus 1 um, and it will never stop so we have to give our um, our starting condition so that will be if um, n is equal to 0 then we know that n factorial um, is equal to 1 or a 0 factorial is equal to 1 so this is 0 factorial is equal to 1 so that is uh, how I can solve this very elegantly using a a recursive function um, and we can of course um, show that this works using um, our same function let me just copy this over here so this is now my factorial recursive and we get the same answer okay so notice the recursion here is in um, my function my factorial recursive where I call the same function but with an argument that's one less than uh, what I used before. Um, now, of course, there's still some issues that um, with this uh, this function. If I if I were to pass, for example, a half, then I would never reach n equal to zero. Um, so then, of course, it would never finish completion. So that might be a problem that we might want to address. So you're going to work with um, the Fibonacci numbers in a homework assignment, and you'll use you'll use recursion in that example. Um, another example where we can use um, the, this recursion is in our Hermit polynomials. So uh, if you've uh, taken any um, math class where you've talked about orthogonal functions uh, for, or, or even a math physics course, um, then you might remember um, these Hermit polynomials. So they're basically a set of polynomials that are defined by a recursion relation and that have um, desirable desirable properties that can be of use in quantum mechanics if you aren't in uh, physics then don't worry about that it's just a mathematical function um, that depends uh, that is defined recursively so we have 
or two first terms H0 or the zeroth order Hermit polynomial which is basically an identity one and then um, minus one is also defined to be one so that allows us then to get to the first Hermit polynomial in terms of um, this one and this zero. So there's a recursion relation that relates the the n plus one order Hermit polynomial to the nth and the n minus one um, order Hermit polynomial. Um, and one of the things you'll see is that um, by multiplying one factor of x to the nth order Hermit polynomial, and because our zeroth order is zeroth order in um, the argument x, uh, the, the nth order Hermit polynomial will always be um, of order n um, in x. So we can uh, write a function Hermit that takes n the order as argument and then x a point where we want to evaluate it um, and we can compare what we get here with um, um, with the, the, the Hermit polynomials, the first four Hermit polynomials um, as shown on uh, Wolfram, uh, Wolfram's um, uh, Mathematica website. So uh, we'll define our Hermit function here to take the order and then x the point where we want to evaluate it. Um, so don't think of this as a mathematical function that is symbolic in X, but think of this as a function that um, where we have to specify also a numerical argument for X. So we can't just think of this as X as a variable um, in the mathematical sense, like we would um, if we write a function um, here, for example, H0 of X or H1 of X that has an actual X in it. So we have to... Um, uh, call this function with an actual argument for x. If n is minus 1, then our Hermit polynomial is exactly 0. Um, if n is equal to 0, our Hermit polynomial is equal to 1. Um, and in all other cases, basically if n um, is, uh, is, is greater than um, 1, and is integer of course, um, then we'll have just 2x times the Hermit polynomial of order n minus 1, minus 2 times n minus 1, the Hermit polynomial um, of n minus 2. Okay? Um, and apparently, I should have had a minus 1 over here in uh, this definition. So let me fix that. Okay. So 2 times n minus 1 times Hermit polynomial of, uh, of n minus 1. Or... No, that was correct, sorry. Um, the formula up here is of course written for H, uh, for Hermit polynomial, polynomial of n plus 1 in terms of n and n minus 1, but here we're writing the Hermit polynomial of uh, order n in terms of n minus 1 and n minus 2, so that's where my n minus 1 um, appears here. So I can uh, then ca call this function with uh, um, the arguments 1, 1, so that will be the first order Hermit polynomial evaluated at the point 1, at x equal 1. Now the first order Herm Hermit polynomial isn't shown here, but we could calculate what that is exactly. I mean, it's going to be a linear function, um, and if we evaluate that, oops, indent So if we evaluate that here, um, I should put, put a print here. Then we find two. So um, does that make sense? Well, the first order Hermit polynomial will be two x times um, the zeroth order minus two times one times the minus one order Hermit polynomial, which is zero anyway. So it will be two times x and two times x evaluated at x equal 1 is indeed equal to 2. Now what you also see is that I've um, made this plot here between uh, minus 2 and plus 2 um, with 100 points and I've plotted um, the Hermit polynomial of order n versus x at the, on those points and I've done this for n um, in the range from 1 to 5 so 1, 2, 3, 4. Similar to the plot that's shown here from Wolfram. Right, so you see that these are the same functions. Um, so this function here is indeed the same as this fourth order Hermit polynomial you see here. So indeed, through our recursion, 
we can now define all of the Hermit polynomials and of course we could easily extend this uh, to uh, let's say um, 10 different Hermit polynomials this will start to look pretty messy um, but we now have uh, defined all of those Hermit polynomials um, and as you can see um, of course many of them just fall at very small values in the y-axis here so maybe if we decrease the range here a bit um, we might see more detail um, so we can start playing around with this. Um, the important thing is to remember that we've defined this recursively. So this is an example where we, we use recursion or we call inside the function, we call the function itself for a different value of the argument. So that's something that you'll see um, come back frequently. Okay, um, so that's all for um, this video lecture. So I'll probably upload another video lecture just talking about um, precision of uh, um, of numbers as represented in computers, in particular those floating point numbers that we've talked about. Um, so do take a look at that because that is something that we will have to rely on um, to understand some of the numerical precision things that are happening in computers, which are very different from what you would expect in um, uh, in, in in a regular mathematical. Um, description that you might be used to um, and that is going to be very important in pretty much everything that follows because it will define how some algorithms are better and how some operations in a computer might not be um, the smartest thing to do because they might um, amplify those issues of numerical precision okay so that's all um, for today um, and uh, please do think about those uh, sort algorithms if you haven't um, done that during the video um, and see if you can write a little sort algorithm in advance of Monday's lecture. Okay, that's all.